Yeah. Recording. All right. So thank you everyone for showing up. We will play this by ear and I'd like to do more of these, especially during these uh, difficult times. I believe uh, people will be able to talk. So if I, I mute you, but what I wanted to do is just chat real quickly about mindset and go over, I got here early today and for those that were around when Show Up Academy, we got this. So I, I, I love looking at this. This is my pride and joy. This is our first $100,000 citation from our competitors. And that was our way of letting other people know that we are on the map. And it was 100% my responsibility and my screw up because I didn't cross my T's and dot the I's. And I wasn't aware of the Bureau of Private Post-Secondary Education. And I wasn't aware of a $500 non-exempt application fee that I did not submit. So rightfully so, think of it as sport. And that's why I love the book Shoe Dog is put yourself in our competition's shoes. If you're playing a sport and one of your, your competitors, they're running off the field late and there's an opportunity to call them out and they're going to get a penalty, you're going to do it. So our competitors knew that I didn't fill out that application and we were smacked with a $100,000 fine. And in those times, it was, it was devastating. And what did I have to do? I had to figure it out. So I can not recall a time in my life where I have read so many books during those six months when I was freaked out because we were essentially on the verge of bankruptcy. And you know, I can't show those emotions and, and feelings to the team because then they're going to start freaking out. I mean, look at the NASA's right now. Everyone's freaking out. So I think that the big take home is that we will get through this and everyone's true colors are really going to come out right now. And so these are the times where you can focus on uh, being the victim and blaming yourself or blaming other people or, you know, really dig down deep and realize that, you know, there are good people out there and we can be at the forefront of that by helping others. So I wanted just to go around real quickly and just have everyone say one thing that you're, you're thankful for and something that you are appreciative in this time that, of uncertainty, especially as a trainer, we don't have an income in right now. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about where we're going to be a week from now, a month from now, healthcare system, we don't know. So let's just go around and uh, everyone give a little, give us your something you're thankful for. Okay, starting right here, Chris. Um, you know, in times like these, you know, I've aspired to be a trainer, but right now I'm just thankful to have a job that's, you know, been able to keep it you know, income coming in and the roof over my head, you know, the things that, you know, we take for granted in day-to-day -day life. And now you really see how important those things are along with your health. Thank you. Who's next? I can go. So I'd say I'm grateful for um, my health. That's like the biggest thing. And the fact that I still um, like have a choice over it. Like I can still choose to, um, exercise and whatnot and i'm not you know disabled in any way so i'm just grateful for good health and families and good health as well so it's good to be on the call love it max thank you hey can you hear me chris yeah hey julie how are you <laughs> hi everyone <laughs> hey. hey uh well i'm just the you know, I'm agree with Max. As soon as we're healthy and our, you know, people who we love healthy, the rest, you know, you can go through because, you know, the rest is just the things. So true. Thank you, Julia. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me, Chris? Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm grateful for having a shelter where to live, to have uh, the necessary things now which are a cell phone, a computer, a uh, connection to communicate with people uh, and family and to be healthy so far as well and to have something to eat. <laughs> yeah. That's great, Eric. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? You don't have to share. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, yay. Um, I'm definitely thankful for my health and all of you guys and to be able to have like a team of people that I can still connect with while all this is happening and feel like, you know, we're still connected with each other. And then definitely just for like the internet in general for to be able to make all that all happen. Um, and for that to be like another source of 
hopefully income for us to kind of like dive into or you know play around with while all of this is going on thank you chelsea Hey, it's Jared. Um, hey, Jared. I'd say just definitely, you know, definitely being healthy, obviously, that's the number one thing. Um, being able to kind of still you know, move around and do things. But the biggest thing for me right now is, you know, taking this time and trying to find different ways or challenging myself in different ways of, you know, to think outside the box that we can, you know, obviously come up with more income, but just more strategies to, to better myself. Okay. Thank you, buddy. Um, oh. no, I'm just Sorry. grateful, you know, to be alive, literally, and living, and I feel like, you know, so many people are complaining, like, oh, I'm going crazy, I'm going nuts, it's like, no, like, use this time to actually go outside and get moving, you know, and I know I'm just blessed to have all of you, and for you, Chris, you know, to just reassure us, you know, that just everything's gonna be okay, you know, just always being, like, positive and super optimistic, and you know, just letting us know that everything will be all right, which I know it will be, but, you know, it's like you said, like, now's the time to, like, I've never listened to so many, like, podcasts or, like, read books and just changed my perspective, you know, and I feel like it's like we took all this for granted, and when all this kind of just went away, we're like, oh, fuck, and it's like, we really need to be thankful, you know, for, like, food that we can get and all that, so just grateful. Anyone else? Yeah, super thankful for my health and to you know be healthy and especially like what Chandler said like the positivity here has been huge because I think everywhere you go it's a lot of chaos so it's nice to you know just grateful to have a community where we're all rational and positive it's been very helpful yep and I'm gonna uh, agree with health right now we have a family friend who's 65 it was unfortunate for her that her mom just passed away so she's been really stressed out and you're going over the body mass equation, you look what happens when you're stressed out, the cortisol levels are gonna be elevated, your immunity is gonna be compromised, you're not eating well, you're not sleeping well. And now she's in the hospital and she has, uh, she has it. So she is on a resp respirator, she's 65 years old, her outlook is very, very glim. I got a buddy who's just got out of the hospital, he has stage three cancer and chat with him. And it's like, there's people out there that are way worse. And so health is really important. Having uh, the internet is also something to, be thankful for because it gives us opportunities to learn remotely and do things like we're going to do right now. So we're going to get into the body mass equation. So you guys should be able to see this pop up. This is the case example that we had, and it's going to go over a hypothetical case example. Susie, she's 5'5", 33 years of age. She's an account manager overseeing $250 million in business. She weighs 145, 30% body fat. She's eating 1,500 calories a day using Calorie King. And she's not losing weight. Calorie King suggests between 1850 to 2050. She wants to lose weight faster. So she's gonna do more extreme. She's doing cardio two to three times a week. F45, Orange Theory, two to three times a week using weights, yoga, Pilates, and very active. Saturdays are her cheat days, so it's her one day to unwind and not focus on reporting your food. She's been weighing herself daily for the past three months. And the scale isn't budging. So what are some reasons Susie isn't losing weight? According to her trainer, she needs to eat more to lose weight because she's not eating enough and in starvation mode. Why is this incorrect? So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna try to take over the floor and I'm gonna do it uh, from just like a normally wooden class. If you wanna speak up, feel free to, but I'm gonna take it from one of the biggest things that I've seen consulting and chatting with Jared and doing brainstorm sessions is how can we be different at Shell Fitness and that specifically from the corporate world. The corporate world doesn't offer, um, optimize any type of nutritional consultations. So they're not making money off of nutrition. And number two, most of the corporate gyms don't have any type of online. I have seen that with recently with Lifetime. I respect that where if seven out of the 10 people that are coming through an assessment are not signing up, 70%. I see that as a huge opportunity from the business perspective to get them into some type of online program. And I have seen that with Lifetime. So that's an interesting area where I think that they are separating themselves from the competition. Why not take 10, 25, 50, maybe $100? If you have a client that can't spend $75 per session, you're committing to anywhere from 800 to 1200, sometimes 1500 per month. Well, what about the people who can afford 200, 400, 600? So there's a lot of opportunity with nutritional consultations and online. And if you sit down with your clients and you really hammer into this, you can add so much value. So first thing 
is we will be like everyone else if we start doing calculations. So I would not advise to say, okay, Susie, here's what we need to do. We need to take your weight, 145, and we're gonna times it by nine. And that's gonna be my suggestion for fat loss. She's a girl. If it was a guy, I'd probably suggest 10. There are other equations that you can use. You can use the Harris Benedict, you can use online calculators. And what they unfortunately do, and this is where she screwed up, and you can't use that vocabulary with her. So I'm talking to you guys as trainers, I'm not talking to you as Susie. So what Susie did is she went in there and she, if you've never used Calorie King's calculator, it gives you a not active, slightly active, very active, and like extremely active. And as we know, as a nation, we overestimate how hard we exercise. So by default, she's going to be giving herself a multiplier of 1.725. So if you take that, her weight, 145 times by 9, it gives you 1305. So on non-workout days, she needs to be consuming 1300 calories to lose fat. Subtract 100 because we can't go below 1200. I'm going to suggest this on paper. 1200 calories on non-workout days and in my opinion she is not getting optimal overload with all of the exercises that she's doing it's very type one which is going to be fat oxidation it's aerobic based the intensity in retrospect is fairly low you can argue with me all you want that f45 is hard orange theory is hard true the analogy i always use it's also hard to drink a bottle of whiskey and sprint across sunset it doesn't mean just because Harder, it's better and so when you look at retrospect we did this in class I believe I'm trying to think who it was I might have been Julia where we had her do yes it was we did a renegade uh, bird dog row so we had two benches and we had her do a row and I think she was able to do 30 pounds she's a very strong girl most of your clients would probably use five or ten pounds so then we had her stand up and do a split leg stance, single arm row, and she was able to do well over 50 pounds. So in retrospect, what these classes do is they really greatly compromise force production. So here's the thing is you can get into great shape doing these classes, but your cardiovascular system really needs to be in tip top shape. And for the average American who almost has coronary artery disease or hypertension or just fat, they can't go through these classes and maintain that intensity. Because you could argue these instructors at F45 Orange Theory CrossFit, they're in amazing shape and they're not setting PRs by doing one to five rep maxes every day, which is true. It's because they have the cardiorespiratory capacity to handle the 60 to 70% loads for an ongoing time period. So I would give her a multiplier of at max 1.375. That would give her 1,800 calories. So if she wants to lose weight, I would subtract probably 200. So my breakdown on paper, which I wouldn't show her yet, would be 1,200 non-workout days, 1,600 workout day. So then you compare it to what she has. Calorie King is suggesting 1,850 and 2,050. The average American, you have to remember, when they do a class, specifically cardio, they're going to take those calories and they're going to add it back into their food. So if I just walk for 30 minutes, the treadmill is going to overestimate how much I actually burned, and it's going to say it's 200 calories. So they then we'll put that back into their food as like, oh, I can have some peanuts tonight. Last night I had, I don't like cookies, I don't have a sweet tooth, but I had two cookies with my favorite right now, the Funfetti frosting. And so I did two tablespoons of that, which is 150 calories, and each cookie was 200 calories. It was 550 calories. And it literally was, was not even filling. You know, Max should be having that for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for him to put some size on for the game train there, bud. But for a client who's trying to lose weight, they're going to have it with some of that funfetti thinking, oh, this is my 200 calories. But in actuality, they just put an extra 400 calories into their body. So they're in a surplus 200 calories. And then we get frustrated. So the big things that we want to address on this or the psychological aspect. And so that's where we're going to come over and take a look at the, the body mass equation. So Eric Helms, and he's a PhD in nutrition and he's very, very smart. You cannot defy this. Remember, the law of thermodynamic law of thermodynamic states. Does anyone want to chime in and tell me what that is? The law of thermodynamics? Energy cannot be created or destroyed. Good. So that means if I were to consume 
500 calories of broccoli versus 500 calories of funfetti. At the end of the day, it's still 500 calories. I would burn more with the broccoli. Why? Because broccoli has a higher thermic effect because it has nutrients. So your body's going to spend energy digesting the broccoli, whereas the other food is empty calories. It just gets stored away to the side. I'm going to challenge you a little bit here, Carlos, because you're correct. But funfetti also has nutrients because it has calories. Okay, I've never actually had it myself. It's fucking delicious. It's Why frosting. It? <laughs> so what does the broccoli have that the funfetti doesn't? Fiber. Fiber, very good. So fiber is going to burn 30 to 35% of those calories. So funfetti, carbs are up roughly 15%. So if I were to have 500 calories of funfetti, 15% of those, let's say it's all carbohydrates, 15% I would burn just by breaking down that funfetti, 75 calories. Whereas the broccoli, 30%. So 150 calories. So I'm literally burning twice as many calories with the broccoli. And it's fun to fuck with people and just to challenge them. 500 calories is 500 calories, yes. But we do need to factor in the fiber because that is important. But also, you are correct, Carlos, the nutrients that we're consuming. You're going to have fiber, you're going to have the, um, micronutrients that the fun fatty will not. But then when you look at this equation, how hungry are you going to be later? And truly, I don't know about you guys, but I, I can't recall a time when I've had 500 calories of broccoli. That's yeah. insane. So the average person can easily have 500 to 1,000 calories of cookies but when it comes to broccoli, not so much. So we got to take a look at this equation because it is about calories in, calories out. And if the equation doesn't add up on paper, and it doesn't with Susie, because if she were to be consuming 1,500 calories a day, what would be happening? I would lose weight. She would lose weight. So there's a couple things that really stick out to me. And, and I don't know if this is just a female thing, but for you guys, was there one thing that really stuck out at you when looking at this case example? Cheat day. Okay, cheat day, that's a big thing. So she could be, she wants to go in an extreme. Let's say she's actually getting 1,200 calories and she's getting, she's in a six, 500 calorie deficit for five days. That's 3,000 calories. Chandler would be the first one to speak up, but it's not hard to have 6,000 calories in a day, right Chandler? You're right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and minimal. <laughs> Bulking season. You, you can have, if I were to put a gun to your head and say, could you have three croissants in one sitting? Do you think you could? <laughs> yeah. Easily. Please, I have a question. Yeah. I have a question for you. So if I eat a croissant, which doesn't have a fiber, but I drink fiber with it, so I'll burn more calories? <laughs> so that's a great question. So let's analyze that where in, in context, true, but you're also consuming more calories. So that's something you need to look at where someone can misconstrue that and say, okay, what I need to do, and this is where our clients get frustrated is, we're not educated, we're just stupid trainers and all we tell people to do is, you gotta eat more protein, eat more fiber. So if the average person starts having more meatballs and steak and meatloaf, that's very calorically dense, so they're going to put on weight. So if your fiber drink has a lot of calories, it may defeat the purpose. Does that make sense? Well, the fiber is no calories. It's just those, you know, um, it's like empty calories. They, they go in and out, you know. So on the, the box or whatever it is, there's zero calories on it? No, it's like a five or okay. something. Then. So the big thing is a croissant isn't going to keep you full long. So if you try it yourself, this would be a great little experiment to do. And I'm giving you permission to do this. So tomorrow in the morning, have a croissant and then go throughout your regular day. And then the next day, do the same thing, have a croissant, but then have that fiber drink and then see how your mindset is throughout the day. I would highly suggest uh, journaling to yourself as well. And then you could you go on a Facebook Live, Instagram Live and tell your, your clients about this and say, I'm doing a really cool, it's called an N1 experience where you are the subject. And I want everyone to try this. Go have one of your quote unquote cheat foods. You will not get fat from it. You will not get 
giant biceps like mine by doing one arm workout, will you, Sam? Because you try and it doesn't work. So you got to be <laughs> consistent. And you can do the same thing. And, and maybe you discover that your energy levels are higher. Maybe that you, uh, maybe it didn't work. Maybe it didn't work. But that's a little, uh, little study you can do by yourself. So okay. the cheat day is definitely something that I would address. And I don't like the word cheat. And I always will make a joke. If she is 33 years of age, I will ask her, I will find out, does she have a boyfriend? Does she have a girlfriend? And I say, how would you feel if your boyfriend or husband cheated on you? And it's always a joke and they'll laugh and be like, no, you can't do that, right? Don't talk to Sam. But you can't cheat. <laughs> Cheating is, is not something that is acceptable in relationships. So why is it acceptable when it comes to food? We need to eliminate that behavior. So what you're doing on Saturday is you're just eating and you're eating foods that you don't eat during the week, which is fine. But if you're at a deficit for 300 calories, five days, that's 1500 calories. And you have that little ice cream sandwich that I had last night, which is roughly 200, 200, 600 calories. You have some mimosas and then you have a burger fries and a shake. You are now at a surplus for well into 500 plus for the week. So you see how frustrating that can be. You, you're diligent for five days and one day could offset it. So the thing that really stuck out of me was weighing yourself every day. And this is where I get into sports analogies. When in sport have they ever stopped a game randomly in the first quarter? I mean, we could make jokes about the times right now, but let's not do that. But generally in sport, you're not going to find that. We're not going to stop the game after it's seven to three in a basketball game or in baseball when it's six to two in the, in the second inning. It's about the end game. So I'm going to challenge weighing yourself every single day. And I want to get into the mindset behind that. So Susie, let's talk about on Monday, you wake up and you weigh yourself. How are you going to feel if you are 146 pounds? And what do you think she's going to say? Well, she would be upset. She would be upset. Okay. Okay, and now her mindset for the rest of the day is going to be negative. She's going to go to work and she's going to honk at someone a little faster than she normally would. And she feels bad about herself. And so she's already set the precedent in her mind that she doesn't look good. Her clothes. Um, oh, nice. Gift from Zoom. They just said that they removed the 40 minute time limit today. So <laughs> we'll still stop at around 40 minutes, but I'll just. Uh, that's nice. So I would suspect that that day is going to be shit. And so we need to rewire her mindset. So Susie, here's my challenge to you. I want you to wake up every morning and I want you to write in your journal to yourself. And I want you to have some categories. And the category is, is going to say, what do you appreciate? When was a time in your life that you really felt sexy? When was a time that you felt very accomplished? How are you going to feel when you're able to do five pull-ups? Find some categories that are going to be measurable outside of the scale. So I think for girls, I think that we need to start a movement where we're measuring ourselves based off of hip thrusts, based off of how many push-ups you can do, how many chin-ups that you can do. That's upper body strength, that's lower body strength, that is glute strength for guys i don't know where it came from powerlifting but we define ourselves ever since high school what is your total lift what is your total score bench squat deadlift for girls whatever fucking reason it's what diet are you on and what cardio are we doing and we need to change that it needs to be you know can you do 20 plus push-ups Susie, you can't that's so awesome because when you can you're not going to give a shit about the scale how many chin-ups can you do? Oh, you can't do any? That's awesome because when you can do five, your body is going to look substantially different. How many times can you do 225 on hip thrusts? Oh, you do a class that gives you a 10-pound weight on your lap and you do it for five minutes. How happy are you with your ass? Oh, you don't like it. Well, when you can do 225 for 20 reps, let me give you some scenarios. Look at, look at this client. Look at this trainer. Look at this person. They can do it. Would you consider them bulky? No, so you're fearful of getting jacked up looking like She-Ra, but it's just fear. It's all it is. You are not going to get bored. 
going to happen is you're going to be able to consume 1,800 to 2,000 regularly and not worry about the scale. What were some other things, part of this equation, that you would have liked to address with her? What her actual cheat day entails, though, like how much is she actually consuming to maybe do a food law with that? Because if the if the trainer gives her like the green light to give her a cheat day and just say, "Oh, consume whatever you would like," I mean, she could be eating thousands of calories, you know, and that could just be hindering with her progress and she may be thinking oh i'm only having like an extra 500 but like you said you know she may be having 10 glasses of wine and 10 tablespoons of peanut butter and that could be like 5,000 calories within a time frame of an hour you know and so chandler just she, opened up pandora's box now we know what chandler is doing at night she's having 10 glasses of wine <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah nice i'm not gonna lie for wine, you know? <laughs> No, but I, I think that was me. So I, I don't know. I really think that that really was me. Like before, well, still, but I mean, at least I know how many calories I'm consuming. But I really think that you know, a lot of these people are like oblivious. Like they don't know at all like, what they're actually consuming, and then they're gonna blame the trainer, saying, "No, like I'm doing what you're telling me to do." And you know, when they actually write it down, well, sometimes they'll lie and it'll still be only like. 1200 and it's like no it's fucking not but you know i don't know you just got to figure out you know what is going to kind of help them help, or help them like tell you the truth you know and be honest but i think you know just having them do like a food log or just taking even pictures mm -hmm. of their meals so you actually know like what they're yeah. consuming and I then agree. just kind of going over that you know and just telling them you know obviously in like a nice manner not being like what the fuck are you eating but you know, just helping them figure out, you know, options that'll help them, you know, get um, less calories in. Great. And so if you look at the mindset behind the average person, so I don't know about you guys, but if you ever managed a book of $250 million, it's a lot of stress that comes with that. So she's going to have a manager who's down her neck because he or she is down, their neck is getting whatever, the same capacity where there's, it's stress, <laughs> stress, stress. So... If you were to look at one day a week, you get to enjoy yourself. That's less than 15% of the week. So imagine someone telling you, hey, good news, you get to enjoy 15% of the week. It's not a lot. So that's, there's a lot that most people are not going to look forward to. So we got to switch that around and say, instead of having one day, let's have a night where you have a glass of wine. That's okay. You don't need to be so restrictive during the week because it can offset everything. So some of the things definitely would be the consumption of food on Saturday, take some photos, but this is where you can have fun with it. All right, Susie, so what we're gonna do, we've been training three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Where do you like to go on, on Saturday? I like to go to Sonoma Wine Garden in Santa Monica. Great, we're gonna go there, and this is gonna be our first nutrition consultation, and it's going to cost you a normal session. We're gonna go there, and we're gonna enjoy ourselves, and you're gonna pay, and I'm gonna teach you how to enjoy yourself. And we're going to go there. Maybe she brings a friend and bring a coworker. So that's now an opportunity to potentially get an assessment out of that. So they're there and you're educating her. So you don't get to have 15 glasses of champagne with the eggs, Benedict, fries, pizza. And <laughs> you get to have some champagne, but then let's have some food that's going to keep you full. So let's get this burger and let's take the top bun off and let's not have the fries and let's have a side salad. Well, that's not fair. Well, you know, life's not fair. I don't think it's fair that LeBron James is 6'10", and I'm 5'10". That's not fair. Life isn't fair. You got to just sometimes, <laughs> and you got to be okay with that. So let's, let's, let's have some victories that we can win. And most important, let's work out on Saturday. Let's work out on Sunday. And let's walk around where it doesn't sound like much, but if you were to walk around for an hour on Saturday, you know, go walk down to the rings after, when you're semi-blacked out and, and just screw around for a little bit and you're going to be burning calories. So you're setting the precedent for a positive mindset. And so the big thing also I wanted to address is the two things on this would be, one, the stresses she's getting from work. We don't talk about water. We don't talk about sleep. And then what happens, have you guys heard this before, where people will talk about the starvation mode? Oh, yeah. The starvation mode is like the Bigfoot. It is not real. And I saw a good meme the, meme the other day. It said, the, the uh, what was it? The best, uh, I'm screwing this one up. It was the best kept, damn it. What are we, we're in quarantine right now. And it was like, the best quarantiner ever is Bigfoot or something like that. I totally ruined it. But 
Anyways, um, <laughs> Bigfoot isn't real, right? So the starvation mode isn't real. Let's take a look at the total daily energy expenditure. So BMR, basal metabolic rate, it's gonna be her liver, her brain, her kidneys, her lungs, her heart, and her muscles. So she's doing a lot of cardio-based work right now, and she's in a deficit. So she will slowly begin to break down her muscle, and that's referred to as degradation. So her muscle, her metabolism when it comes to her muscle mass, her lean body mass, will slowly begin to decrease. On top of that, cortisol levels increase. When cortisol levels increase in a deficit, what hormone decreases? Testosterone. Um, testosterone. So testosterone is your confidence hormone. So our cortisol, think of it as fight or flight. I'm now scared. That is going to continue to go up. If, her, if our sleep isn't optimal, it's going to continue to go up. If we're stressed out and we're just consuming a ton of caffeine, it's gonna to continue to go up. So we can't offset the system by sleeping optimally. So our cortisol levels run real high. Testosterone is running low due to the deficit in the stressful environment. So what we could do is consume enough protein to lower the catabolism of the muscle. So here is, an example of our muscle. So when we consume protein, that's referred to as anabolism. So I just did a workout and then I'm going to rebuild my muscle because I broke down my myofibrils, actin and myosin. I have sarcoplasmic hypertrophy as well as myofibril hypertrophy. So thinking like this sleeve right here, I can put a bunch of these sleeves on my, on my cup and that's going to be hypertrophy. So that is one way to grow muscle. The other way is to preserve muscle. So let's pretend like I take a needle and I poke the bottom of the cup. That's referred to as protein catabolism. Both are maintaining muscle. One is building, one is degrading. So in this environment where I have high lots of stress and I'm not rebuilding my muscle optimally, I don't have as many of these sleeves, one, but also I have a larger hole in the bottom. So my muscle is going to get smaller. So I have to make my system inferior. And on top of that, she's a cardio bunny. So she's doing 30 to 45 minutes of running, which is going to increase the protein degradation. So if we're not eating a lot of carbs, which I bet you she's doing, because that's what most people do during a state of def um, deficiency. Carbs are bad, right? So we're going to lower our carbs. So when we go for our run, our muscle glycogen is going to be lower. If we're dehydrated on top of having low muscle glycogen, we are going to get into our glycogen faster. And what that means is, think of it as driving a giant fucking truck through town with a huge hole in the gas tank and your tires are low. It means you're going to burn even more gas. So we don't want that in her state because the faster we go through gas, what's going to happen? Well, you can't drive anymore. <laughs> True, but in her case, the protein. there you go. You're going to break down yeah. more protein. Muscle. So her whole system is a perfect example of what we don't want. So what we need to do is, cons so what people will do is her energy levels are now going to be lower. So her NEAT is lower. And so she is now not going to walk around as much. Her hunger is going to be higher. Her hormones are fucked up. The whole entire equation is terrible. So then what happens is she is not moving around as much, so she hits a plateau. She hates her life because she only gets to enjoy Saturdays. And then on Saturdays, she gets so drunk that she doesn't do shit on Sundays, and she doesn't report to you what she's doing. So she's gaining weight. So her trainer looks at her food log and says, oh, it's pretty obvious. You're not eating enough. You need to eat more. So then for whatever reason, something clicks in her mind that she doesn't want to hang out with her shitty friends on the weekend and go out and get blacked out drunk anymore. So she eliminates that and she starts eating more so her workouts get better. So then what happens to her scale? It starts to go down because she's actually losing fat because she's moving around more and her workouts are better. And what people will attribute that to is the fact that she ate more. But in actuality, the whole equation is what was altered. 
And so these things are really valuable because your clients are confused and they're frustrated because the factors that aren't being addressed, sleep, stress, hydration, hunger, alcohol, environmental factors, and everything that we have on the, ah, on this board is being affected. So I like to address mindset. I think that's really important. I like to address how she handles hunger. I like to look at alcohol because I feel, and this is a, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're trainers and I think trainers are generally fairly healthy. I would probably say Jared and I are the only borderline alcoholics on here. Everyone else is pretty responsible with their alcohol consumption. But I think I'm- Danny? Our, you, know, you pretend to drink, but- I, think, I said Danny. <laughs> Oh, Jamie, how about you? Uh, Dougie, yeah. oh, so you're a big drinker. Stuart wants, wants to no. drink too. <laughs> and me too. Okay, Eric. Okay. Well, uh, we're, uh, we're a group of um, luxury. Tequila. Like, <laughs> I think that for, for those that don't drink, so Julia, this will, I've talked to you in class about this. This will be a challenge because one, you're, you're already super intimidating because you're in great shape and people look at you and they're going to play victim by saying, oh, it's because of her genetics and and then all of a sudden you start telling them that you don't drink and your one cheat every three months is a croissant. So they're going to think <laughs> you're like this super goddess that is just fake. And so when you can just relate to them and you tell them that you have your flaws and, and blah, 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 then it just, it makes us more human. So your clients are coming into the assessment very um, frustrated and we got to be empathetic. And so that's why I do talk about alcohol and I address the other things because in their mind, they think that they have a disease, but they don't. What they have is they haven't been educated properly. And that's the value in working with us as smart coaches is we can address the factors that I guarantee you not any other trainer has addressed. They're going to tell them it's because your carbs. They're going to tell them it's because of their alcohol. You got to give that up. You got to give up sugar. You got to give up this. And they're just going to start giving blanket statements that are not realistic because she doesn't know, Susie, she doesn't know how to handle stress. When it's six o'clock at night, she weighed herself that morning and the scale was heavier. She goes home. She has no energy now to exercise. So what does she want to do? She wants to escape life. And how do people escape life when you're isolated by yourself and that environmental factor? is going to be isolation. You're going to drink, you're going to eat, and you're going to do things to make yourself feel better temporarily. And this is a problem psychologically, and this is where we need to address it. We're not shrinks, but we can have the open in the conversation saying that next time you're home, what you do? let's do a set of push-ups. Let's do jumping jacks. Let's have a glass of water. It's not about this all or none approach. So if you've not done a nutritional consultation with a client, I think this is a great opportunity to use your social platforms to offer a free session. I'm going to choose one lucky person and we're going to do an Instagram live and we're going to do a nutritional consultation. Normally this is $250. What I'm going to do is we're going to go over your food log. I want you to take photos of what you're consuming. I want you to, to write out your workouts. I want you to tell me your three biggest concerns right now in your areas that you want to work on. And then when you as the coach address this, don't address the obvious. So if they tell you they're eating 1,200 calories, don't address that because they're going to be mind fucked. And they're going to think, what the heck? Why didn't my coach address the 1,200 calories? I know you're not eating 1,200 calories. What is it going to do to tell your, your client, you're lying to me, you're not eating 1,200 calories? So we need to educate and say things such as, did you know the average American over, sorry, underestimates how much they eat by 50%. So I've had clients in the past that told me they were eating 1,500 calories. And when we did a food log, it was closer to 2,700. I didn't point a finger at my client saying, that's what you're doing. I'm giving an example. And so then what that does is it helps them not feel like they're being threatened or being, you know, the fingers being pointed at them. It's giving them an opportunity to, to learn from other experiences. And if you haven't had these experiences, fabricate and just tell them you have and use something that I've, that I've encountered before. I told you some of this, here are some extreme situations I've worked with. I've, I've worked with people who've reported having one to two glasses of wine. And then we actually fact checked that it was three bottles. 
So you look at a food log having 300 calories versus a food log that should have 2,500 calories from alcohol. I had a client who was a big pothead and I didn't know about it. I don't smoke weed, so I don't know. And we did her food log and she wasn't losing weight. And then it just it frustrated the hell out of me because something was off. And then we stuttered, she stuttered, when we started analyzing her nighttime routine. And I'm like, there's something up right here. What is it? Her name was Sally. And she was getting ready for her wedding. And Sally was like, well, my husband and I, we have um, picnics for dinner. And I'm like, what? I've never heard that before. But what they'll do is they'll smoke weed and then they'll have a little food picnic while they watch their favorite shows. And she loved poppycock. I know that sounds sexual, but it is not. It is a form of popcorn that you can get at Costco and the bag has a thousand calories. And she said that it would, a lot of times her husband would pass out and she would eat the whole bag. So, I mean, your clients are hiding a lot of these scenarios. And I think the best one I've come across is the bikini competitor who ate a whole Costco jar of uh, peanut butter. And that's, oh, yeah. that's insane. That's well over 4,000 calories. <laughs> it's not insane, okay? It's, it's easy to consume all of that. <laughs> I guess it's the same way. I wish I could eat that in a day. <laughs> so what it comes down to is the, this body mass equation can change the game. It can help make more money. If you were to have 10 clients right now that you were training online and 20% of them were to invest in your nutritional guidance services, you could charge an extra 100 to 200 per person. That's an extra four to $500 per month. If your online business was 50 clients, that's significant. That's a supplementary income of anywhere from 1,000 as much as 5,000, depending on how many people you have. Think big, think, get creative. What if you were to take two or three students from the internship once they graduate and you really get them to be a savant with the body mass equation, they can meet with, your, your clients can meet with them. And then you have a, a tree essentially where it's $250 to work with you per hour. And I wouldn't even put per hour, I'd say per consultation. And then you could have your employees under you, they could be doing consults at 125. They can report back to you and if they come back and say, yeah, this person's really jacked up, I think that we should make a referral. That's where you can link up with a registered dietitian, you link up with a psychologist, and now you've taken your circle of trusted professionals and you've given a referral out looking out for that client's best interest. So any questions about the body mass equation or Susie? No, uh, more question about the guys who can't build muscles. Like uh, it's, it, you would say, don't count the macros, just give them calories number. That's a great question. So you have a, a, a guy. Say they have to count macros. You, like, you have a guy specifically? Yes. Yeah, so you, you have a guy like, and something you're going to hear a lot is he is an ectomorph. An ectomorph is just a tall, skinny guy. So think of Matt. And what he's trying to do <laughs> is, is put some size on. So mm. the equation is two things. What are the two things that we know for fact? He's not eating enough calories. He's not eating enough and calories? Yes, because I asked him to log in uh, in a fitness pal yesterday and and uh, definitely he's not eating enough protein because his uh, portion of meat like a 50 grams. Like I'm, you know, <laughs> that's like most of his, uh, it's carbs. Yeah, so that's where you can kind of make fun of him, Julie, be like, I eat 125 grams. I will crush you. I'm better. <laughs> so she, he needs to be eating a lot more. It's always, guys, it's you know, politically correct, whatever. But girls, you can definitely get away with this. And you can say, like, come on, you're eating like, you're eating like a little girl, dude. You got to eat some more. So you know. Yeah, and uh, he's 150 pounds. He's, like, he's not tall, so he's 150 pounds. And he's eating like... Um, uh, a thousand uh, 1400 calories and that was his best day when he count the food and he tried to make it healthy yeah. but he said well, usually he eats less yeah so it's you don't want to criticize but what you want to do is educate so, okay so here's my challenge for you people need application so great so this is really exciting because you're frustrated you can't put size on but you're not eating enough it's pretty simple so here's my challenge for you i want you to wake up and here's a great little mass gainer 
I want you to make a smoothie, throw some oats in there, put some blueberries, banana, a couple tablespoons of peanut butter, and then a scoop of protein. That's gonna give you roughly 30 to 40 grams of protein. That's gonna be your breakfast. For lunch or throughout the day, one time I want you to eat a bar. Cliff bar, Quest bar, whatever, I just want you to eat an extra bar. Before you go to bed, I want you to have a scoop of casein. Now casein is unique if you can have animal products because it is time released. And so you're going to get protein released throughout the night. Where whey protein is going to be the best, but if you have a client that cannot have any type of animal products, then suggest for them to have a steak. I'm just joking. Have some type of <laughs> vegan sport or have um, tofu or some rice and beans and some cheese that is vegan, but you need to get more calories throughout the day. What is the other part of the equation when it comes to size? Well, he's not working out uh, hard enough. And so when you look at intensities, if someone tells you that their workouts are really hard, but they're not putting on size, what are the three things that determine, don't think of it as stress, tension, and damage. What are the three things that determine uh, long-term hypertrophy? Stress, sleep, no. 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 Fit. So yeah, it's frequency, definitely. Intensity, Intensity. time and time. time, time. So not time and type, but it's V. What's V? Velocity. 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 Nope. Are baseball players jacked? Uh, volume. Good. So it's going to be the total volume of your workout. So uh, right now we have a lot of people doing these push-up challenges. And, you know, I challenge you guys to do your funny face push-ups every day. I'm every day changing up the volume of my push-ups, where sometimes I'll do 12 sets of 25 for 300. Some days I'll do four sets of 25 two sets of 50, and then two sets of AMRAP. Sometimes I will do uh, banded push-ups for 30 sets of 10. I'm changing up the acute variables. So don't just tell someone to start doing 300 push-ups. You ask how many push-ups he can do. And if he's a 150-pound dude, I'm guessing you can probably do 15 to 20 push-ups. So challenge him to do 100 push-ups a day, 10 sets of 10. And then you check in with him the next day to see how sore he is. And if he's not that sore, then increase the volume. Go to 125. So don't just go from 100 to 200 to 300 to 400. You know, if he can't even do 10 push-ups, doing 100 push-ups would be way too much. He so said he can do 15 push-ups. 15. So then I would do 10 sets of 10. And then check in with him tomorrow, see how he feels. If he's a little bit sore, perfectly all right, do another 100. Get enough protein after the workout, slam down a shake of uh, 25 to 30 grams of protein. And then as a coach, this is where you can get a lot of value and start making money off your clients is you tell them, I want you to, to put five minutes on the clock and see how many push-ups you can do. And then you take that number and then next week you have them do it again. And the next week you have them do it again. What you're going to find is this number is just going to keep on going up. So we're increasing the total volume. And then we got to look at the intensity of his workouts. Generally, guys will be doing three sets of 10 and he's not going to failure so you want him to go up in weight a or b complement his chest day which is probably bench press incline and some sort of dip or fly complement them with push-ups so then you look at the volume equation you're doubling it if he's doing mm -hmm. once a week have him do it twice a week how long should he implement a plan to start noticing some results a couple months yeah, four minimum weeks. four weeks, so I'm going to say you'll probably start noticing a change within eight weeks. Mind you, if he's a beginner and he hasn't been working out, let's pretend he's a runner, and he's been doing a lot of yoga and running for the last three years, and now he just wants to get absolutely massive. The first month, he's not going to get absolutely massive, and why is that? Neuromuscular adaptation. Good, so he's going to get a lot stronger, and you could even argue that he doesn't even need to do endurance training because he's been doing yoga and running so i would hypothesize that his connective tissue his ligaments and tendons are probably pretty strong but he's not going to see a lot of size so the first month think of it that's what we call the miyagiisms you're just learning the proper patterns if he just wants to get upper body size i'll focus more on the horizontal pushing and pulling and the vertical pushing and pulling with adding in two days of legs you choose the patterns maybe it's a, a hinge pattern a squat pattern if it is a bro, be mindful that putting in a bunch of hip thrusting in the beginning may deter him, just like implementing bench press for a girl in the beginning with weight may deter her. So you got to be smart, do more squats and trap bar deadlifts. 
And then after a month, that's when we can start increasing the volume. So getting down to eight to six reps. I'm finishing up our textbook right now, of which we will have a example of a, of a guy who is a 40 year old lawyer who wants to put some size on, but lose some fat, stereotypical Android, which is gonna be probably you know, 35, 40% obesity. And what that program would look like for essentially six months. So you can see the transition from month one to month two, from month two to month three, month four to month six, and helping them get their long-term goals. So with that being said, I've been having some fun criticizing NASM. And if you're not friends with me on Facebook, make sure to friend request us. And this is Chris Hitchko, by the way, not the, like the show up page. And I had a really, it's, just, it's really interesting to see the conversations you can have with educated folk. So I did a post the other day asking why everyone, why they think people suggest NASM so much. And you know, Jared can attest to this, but as a manager in a corporate gym, a lot of trainers, assistant managers and managers, when asked from an aspiring trainer, how do I become certified? And just like a lot of you, you were told to get NASM certified. And that's what we're trying to establish and address is why. Why are the masses encouraging people to go the same route that everyone else is doing? Hence why we have such a high attrition rate. And so in this debate, in this thread, it was really neat to see some really, really smart professors, instructors from NPTI, and people that are not dogmatic in their thinking. They have a very, very sound foundation for strength and conditioning and anatomy and movement. And they address the big picture and they just, and they basically say that NASM is a marketing machine. The reason that they do what they do is because no one's holding them accountable. And at the end of the day, they're making millions of dollars. So why should they change? In the beginning, they had a vision, but that vision has changed because they're now a large corporation and they're owned by one of the largest investment firms. So they have a ton of capital to invest. And, and so it's it just a really neat thread because on, on Instagram, it's funny because I have some haters and they're, you're so negative, blah, blah, blah. Ironically, as we're going through our body mass equation of which one of the things we talk about is a positive mindset. And that's what we're addressing with Susie here. It's, it's just, we got to stir the bees nest to, to get people to think differently, but it's not that we're being negative. We're trying to educate people who've been taught wrong. And so it's, it's a challenge that we're going to continue to spearhead it. And we're going to ch continue to challenge it until my dream is when people go to a corporate gym and they want to become a trainer and they know they have to go through an internship and they need to go through something like what we have here at Show Up Fitness, where you learn movements, you learn anatomy, but then you go out there on the floor and you practice it. So any other questions before we, we call it a day? And I would like for you guys just to shoot me a little message afterwards if you found this valuable, if you like other topics during the week, if you wanna have more of these, maybe we have one on Wednesday and Friday. What can I do to help you guys during these times of uncertainty to keep on growing your brain, whether if it's client scenario, workout scenarios, injuries, whatever I can do. But before we sign off, was there any questions that you guys had today? Yeah. So back to the gaining muscle or for the, when you're talking about the guy. So if, let's just say if the person, or I guess just anyone in general, if they're eating enough calories, but their protein is lower, like why is it that they say you should get like 0.8 to one gram per pound of body weight? Like why is it specifically that number? So if that guy were to, let's just say, consume 2000 calories and that's what he needed to gain weight but he weighed 150 pounds and only got like 100 grams of protein and the rest were carbs and fats. Is that really going to interfere with his gaining muscle or what, why is it specifically so, like that? For great question. So the International Society of Sports Nutrition, and this is going to be Dr. Jose Antonio and also Eric Helms, check out their Instagram and they will have scientific studies that will show the minimal amount for hypertrophy. And that is going to be in metrics. So you will see for someone who's trying to gain, I believe the, it's called the minimal dose effect, MSD, MDS, minimal dose effect, M-E-E, -E, minimal dose effect to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. And it gets even further, and this is what Lane Norton's expertise is with leucine. So 
there is an upper threshold and a lower threshold for leucine to optimize protein synthesis. And I believe it's right around you know, 1.2 grams per kilogram. So in the case scenario you just said, for a 150-pound dude who's getting 100 grams, that would be sufficient enough to stimulate mus muscle protein synthesis. So if he was getting 100 grams, you'd have to ask, is he truly getting 100 grams? A, is he truly in a surplus? B, but C, that would lead me to suspect more that his workouts suck and the intensities aren't there. Because if he really is getting 100 grams, that would be enough to stimulate muscles to grow. So something else with the equation would be off. There is a lower end, and at the same token, though, there's an upper end. So this is where guys will go on the, what do they call it, um, a dirty bulk, and they'll just start eating five, six, seven thousand calories, but then they'll put on a lot of fat too. So there's, it's a happy medium. So it's the same thing with like, uh, this is a great post by Breck Contreras, and it talks about the amount of sets for, per week to stimulate muscle protein synthesis, and the range is between 10 to 40. So people get confused by that because they say, well, which one is it? Is it 10 or 40? And people want the magical number. And it's, there's no magical number. There's a range. So we know that you got to have a minimum of at least 10. Depending on your genetics, depending on your condition state, your body, your health, upper end would be 40. If you're doing more than 40 sets, you're, you're, you're not working out hard enough and you're not getting optimal working sets. If you're only doing three or four sets, you're not getting enough. You need to find the threshold that works for you and having the proper stimulus with the intensity. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you. I don't have a question, but I'm going to make you guys a little more grateful. Check out outside here in Michigan. Can you see or no? Oh, my snow? God. Snow. Yeah, it's, it's all snowy. So, oh, man. yeah. Hey, by the way, I'm stuck here till. Uh, April 13th now. Yeah. There's no flights or anything. It's probably going to be even longer than that. So, yeah. Uh, last person, Sam, you forgot to tell us what you're thankful for. So tell us real quickly and then we'll sign off for the day. Uh, hi, guys. I'm thankful for um, to, have a to have a home, uh, to, to stay healthy, to... Uh, to all my uh, short uh, family, who uh, I, I guess, and I hope everybody is fine and everybody uh, have everything and need nothing, and uh, just uh, keep 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 up, um, the good mind, good good mindset, uh, be positive, and uh, I know these days are not really good for us, but um, we like you doing today is great because. Uh, the mindset is gonna be is gonna be better, and we, we we go forward. Thank you. So I'll challenge you guys: if you go out there and you get coffee and go through the drive-through, leave an leave an extra five bucks and buy the person behind you some coffee. Do some good deeds. Help reach out to those clients you've worked with in the past. Maybe you haven't talked to in months or years. Send a nice little text. How can I help you with your current training program? And maybe reach out to some of your local little communities. There's a number you can even call where you can call old people at home and they're just kind of lonely and you can you know, have a five or 10 minute call, just kind of chatting with them and giving them some, some good words of advice. So uh, that was an hour. I appreciate you guys all for showing up. Hopefully found this. Thank time. you. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. Everyone. Have a great day. Bye, guys. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye everyone. Love you. Bizu, bizu. Bye, Chris. Love you. Bye. Love, love you. you. Bizu, bizu. I love you so much, Chris. <laughs> yeah. We love you.